Thanks everyone for coming and, and thank you for inviting me here. Uh, so as Kevin said, I'll talk a little bit about this work on um, capturing long range temporal correlations in multi-time quantum processes. So uh, yes, this was in collaboration with people here, including Neil Dowling and Kevin Modi. And uh, if you would like to read more, then you can find the archive link here. Um, today though, I want this talk to be a little bit more pedagogical in terms of the background uh, to this paper. So, um, hang on, let me, there we go. Um, so in terms of what to expect, uh, I'd like to speak a little bit about uh, quantum correlations generally um, and how these are structured. And in particular, um, a notion known as tensor networks in quantum information theory. So this is like a diagrammatic way of understanding quantum mechanics and quantum systems. Um, and how the study of this kind of leads you to understanding interesting physics about quantum matter. And then move on to uh, how you can translate some of these ideas to the temporal domain. So with open quantum systems, you can have uh, stochastic processes that have correlations in time. And these actually have a surprisingly similar structure to those of spatial correlations. So um, this will be sort of uh, the majority of the talk comprising you know, uh, predominantly background and context. Uh, and then I'd like to talk a little bit about some of our results in terms of um, translating uh, these interestingly structured tensor networks to the, the temporal setting. <coughs> okay, so what I want to talk about today, or everything I want to talk about today, mostly concerns what goes on inside a quantum computer or what is hopefully one day going to go on inside a quantum computer. More specifically, an abstraction of that. So there are roughly three stages to a quantum computation. So we have some initial state, some quantum state, which is composed of various different two-level subsystems. And these can be physically manifested by trapped ions, superconducting loops, photons, spins. There are a whole host of competing hardware designs for these sorts of things. And the goal is basically to design an interesting, design and realize an interesting quantum evolution, which maps that state to some other interesting, possibly entangled state with a lot of structure, and then to make measurements at the end. And then when you make these measurements, what you get is a series of uh, outcomes with um, probability given by the regular Born rule. And in these mock bit string outcomes, I've assigned them different colors to emphasize that in quantum mechanics, you not only get one type of measurement, you can measure along many different axes. <coughs> So there is a, a freedom of choice in this respect. So you might have heard that we're entering an era known as the second quantum revolution. And broadly speaking, the, the delineation here is supposed to be that in the first 100 years, we had these quantum mechanical properties which were studied and led to a lot of technologies through the understanding of those. Um, and the kind of purported direction is that we are now designing quantum systems or engineering quantum systems to um, basically manufacture interesting quantum phenomena at will to do things like realize quantum algorithms, um, foundational experiments, quantum sensing, um, cryptography, these sorts of things. And at the heart of all of this are uh, quantum correlations. So the ability for quantum systems to possess or uh, exhibit correlations which are stronger than what any classical system can. So this is the sort of phenomena that led to uh, the, the experimental realization of which led to the Nobel Prize in physics in 2022. Um, which was a, a, an experimental test of the violation of Bell inequalities. Um, basically, the idea is to get this working at uh, a scale of thousands or millions of these sorts of um, quantum systems. <coughs> okay, so let's unpack this a little bit in terms of um, many body physics. <coughs> so what you can imagine is that we, we have some quantum state and the constituents to the state can be correlated in various different ways. So they can have different uh, interesting structures. And by correlated, what I kind of want you to envisage for the time being is that you know, two systems are correlated if collectively, like if you look at them together, they contain more information than if you were to look at either of the subsystems separately. And the way that you witness this or that you realize this is by making measurements, joint measurements on each of the subsystems. So this is not a quantum phenomena. We can have uh, stochastic systems which exhibit only classical correlations. So for example, if I give you two coins and the coins for whatever reason always tossed and landed both on heads or both on tails, 
then you could witness this by making lots of um, coin tosses and seeing that you have the same outcome uh, all the, the time, as opposed to having independent outcomes. And at the, but th there's only sort of, in, in a classical sense, there's only sort of one way in which you can look at uh, a classical system, right? You can only uh, observe the outcome of the coin and you see whether it was heads or tails. Um, but in the quantum setting, we have both classical and quantum correlations, which includes entanglement. And the key, one of the key features of entanglement is the ability to realize um, you can measure your system in many different ways. So you can pick an axis along which to measure a certain choice of basis and uh, realize correlations across different axes. And then in total, kind of collectively, you end up with uh, kind of more shared information between these systems, which can be uh, exploited. And there's interesting physics in terms of how these correlations can be distributed. So in terms of whether they can be short range, whether they can be long range, um, and we'll, we'll, we'll get into that. But what I want to talk about in terms of the language of, of how to think about correlations. So I think a, a common feature to a lot of fields of theoretical physics is kind of the desire to take complex algebraic expressions and convert them into nice interpretable fixture, uh, pictures. So in the sense of Feynman or Penrose or these sorts of things. And in quantum information, this is done uh, via the insight that linear algebra can be done, performed uh, graphically. So um, using a series of techniques called graphical calculus or tensor networks, you can basically make linear algebraic manipulations by just a series of box and wire diagrams. And I don't particularly want to get into the, the minutiae of all this. Um, except to kind of point out that this is possible um, and mostly focus on, on the basics of what this means. So um, tensor network diagrams allow you to perform some kind of uh, composition of, of different operators or quantum states. And you can basically imagine that as you, if you have open wires, these constitute uh, like an index. So if you have a vector, it corresponds to like the rows of that vector. Or if you have a matrix, you have one Y which represents the rows of the matrix and one Y which, which represents the columns of the matrix. And then you can um, broadly extend this to multi-dimensional tensors. And you can connect these objects in order to compose them. So suppose you have a, a, a matrix A and a vector B and you want to produce a vector C through matrix vector multiplication. Then in index notation, the ith component of C is given by summing over the columns of the matrix A with the, um, the rows of vector B. And we can just express this in terms of this simple connection of y's here. So we have uh, that the, uh, the component i here is given by some open wire on this vector C, or equivalently here. And that the summing, the implicit summing over this index J is given by the connection of y is here. So this is just like a graphical version of um, Einstein notation. And now importantly, if we have open wires, then we can think of these as like inner products which are waiting to happen. So it allows us the possibility that we would contract a separate object with those wires. That's an inner product mathematically. It gives us a real number, and that real number might be experimentally realized, experimentally measured. It, it um, constitutes a, a physical prediction. Okay, so what's interesting about tensor networks beyond just being like a mathematical tool to simplify things? I should, I should say that they are a mathematical tool to simplify things, so they allow you to simplify complex networks before actually performing computations. But as with any kind of um, new technique or new way of looking at uh, at things, you end up with conceptual insight. And so for this reason, tensor networks, or the study of tensor networks, has evolved into its own mature field in its own right uh, over the last couple of decades, which is to say that some of the insights from this have now given us insights into quantum matter, and in particular, the structure of, of correlations. So one way in which you could uh, envisage this is um, if I have a quantum state represented by a density matrix, let's say it has uh, n constituent subsystems, then I could represent this as a 2 to the n by 2 to the n matrix. It has exponentially many entries. I could similarly represent this as a tensor, which gives the individual subsystem some character. So you could think of this like in Pythonic terms as taking a matrix and just reshaping it into 
an n-dimensional array with um, each dimension having size 2. But something interesting that you can do if you continue along these lines is if you use techniques for matrix factorization, you can actually re-express this quantum state in terms of some um, individual tensors which contain essentially local information about the local subsystems as well as the, what I've depicted in uh, these purple diamonds here, some internal information. And what that internal information represents is the entanglement between each subsystem and the rest of the state. And what's interesting about this is that we now have a representation of the state, which is um, it has n of these tensors. And then the question is, how quickly does the information um, relating some subpart of the state to the rest of the state, how quickly does that grow? Because if that doesn't grow too quickly, or if it's not too large, then in principle we can represent the exact same information, which would be exponentially large in terms of um, a smaller number of parameters, uh, uh, an efficient number of parameters. But additionally, kind of what this insight gives us, gives rise to, is the question, um, we can start asking the question, how does the entanglement between some block of a quantum state and the rest of the state grow as I increase the size of this block. So there are two regimes, roughly speaking, that we might like to think about. The first regime uh, that I've just uh, discussed is the regime at which we have some fixed amount of correlation. So some fixed amount of information shared between the block and the rest of the state as I increase the size of the block. And this is what's referred to as a non-critical state. Similarly, or kind of conversely, if I have that the amount of entanglement between some block and the remainder of the state grows extensively with the remainder of the state, um, then this, uh, this is referred to as a 1D critical state. And in particular, what this means, the, the distinction here is that we have on the first hand, short range entangled states, and on the second hand, long range entangled states. And these uh, two distinctions um, are sometimes referred to as different quantum phases. So the way that we typically think about phases is, say, in the context of uh, you know, solids or liquids or gases, some internal structure, and there's a transition from this internal structure um, with, say, an increase in temperature. And over the last few decades, there's been this nice insight that uh, there can be quantum phase transitions, so in particular zero temperature phase transitions which occur that um, map not some, uh, some of these other statistical mechanical properties of the state, but rather which change the entanglement structure of the state. So in this case we can have a, a state which goes from short range entangled to long range entangled. Um, and uh, that's measured by a quantity, um, this uh, this internal information is measured by a quantity known as, as the bond dimension. So to unpack that a little bit further, <coughs> we can start asking questions, what properties does this uh, entanglement structure of a state actually tell you? So to kind of uh, recompose that, I look at some block of a state and I want to say how, uh, is most of the entanglement contained within that block or is it between that block and the rest of the state? And so in the former case, we have this constant entanglement, and this is efficiently representable uh, in contrast to something which has extensive entanglement. From a condensed matter perspective, uh, the former class and, um, can be shown to be the ground state of a parent Hamiltonian which has a gap between its uh, lowest energy and uh, the next energy state, whereas in this critical case, uh, this constitutes a parent Hamiltonian which is gapless, i.e. It, it has no energy gap. The former case has properties like exponentially decaying correlations. So if I look at these two red uh, sites and I want to make a measurement and, and look at some observable and see whether it's correlated between them, then I can expect the value of that correlation function to decay exponentially. Uh, whereas in the latter case, um, we have long range correlations and these decay much slower, these decay uh, polynomially. Uh, the former case is well classified into a class of states known as matrix product states. Uh, in the latter case, this is much more complicated. Um, and you can also relate properties like the complexity of preparing these states. So 
uh, not, not to get into this too much, but uh, quantum information theorists often care about how much evolution time or how many uh, quantum gates you need to apply to prepare a particular state in the lab. And it can be shown that this former class um, essentially only requires like a logarithmic number of gates to prepare, whereas the latter class is at least um, linear. So uh, th there are consequences in real terms of having long range entanglement versus short range entanglement. One special class of uh, these critical states is um, known as the multi-scale entanglement renormalization ansatz. So not all critical states can be represented in efficient ways and cannot be studied in efficient ways, but uh, this particular class can. And this is in what's known as a hierarchical tensor network. So in a hierarchical tensor network, we have different layers um, which get uh, exponentially smaller as we go from um, various scales. And the bottom layer is what is these open indices are representing the quantum state. But what's happening between the layers is essentially a form of renormalization in the sense that, you know, you might say, okay, uh, I have a spin chain and it has this many sites. And then I want to say, what does the average of the nearest two or three spins look like? If I were to redefine my spin chain where I took every three sites and I made it into one site through some transformation, I would have a new spin chain, which was smaller. And then I could uh, look at the properties of that. And then um, I could kind of continue this kind of coarse graining until I had, uh, like I was arrived at the very top of that spin chain. And so each layer here you can uh, imagine as corresponding to these kind of uh, longer range properties. And in particular, so again, not to get too bogged down in the details, but um, the mirror tensor network is very useful because the properties of it can be, um, can be determined in some efficient way in contrast to other approaches to a, to a similar problem. So maybe let's unpack a little bit what I mean about correlation scaling. So the basic question here is, if I have some operator on two sites um, that I measure, so I pick, you know, let's just say the, um, the expected value of the magnetization of a spin and I can look at how that operator looks like collectively. So when I measure it on two sites simultaneously, that's this expression, and the difference between whether I do that uh, collectively or whether I do it on each site individually. And basically the value of this so-called correlation function tells us uh, how much information that these different sites share. And so we can ask for these different sorts of states how this value scales as a function of distance. And in particular, uh, with typical states, this generically um, decays exponentially, like negative exponentially with the distance. But what's interesting in contrast about these two classes of, of quantum state is that if I look here um, and I increase the distance between each site, then, uh, then the connectivity goes down. The, the, the connectivity sort of, um, sorry, scales with the distance between those sites. But if I look at this uh, tree tensor network or this, this mirror tensor network, then I can see that even though this site and this site, these, these yellow indicated ones, even though I might increase the distance between them linearly, the connectivity is actually logarithmic. So I can actually go from this site to this site to this site to this site to this site. And so uh, the decay of the correlation function happens polynomially, uh, not exponentially. And what this looks like on a log-log plot is that as you increase the distance between the sites on the left-hand side, this correlation function generically decays exponentially, whereas um, on the right-hand side, the correlation function goes down like this linear um, type function. Okay, so this is like, uh, I guess, roughly speaking, a way in which you can look at, which you can think about quantum states in terms of like a, a short range entanglement classification versus a long range entanglement classification and how you can represent these uh, using tensor networks um, in a linear stru structure versus this hierarchical, hierarchical tree-like structure. 
Everything I've talked about so far has concerned purely uh, spatial correlations. So I have a single quantum state, and I look at it at a single time, and I ask, what's the entanglement structure uh, between the different subsystems? But you can actually ask a fairly equivalent question in terms of what are the temporal correlations of a single subsystem across many different times. So suppose um, I have some system accessible to me and it's interacting with a whole bunch of other quantum systems. Uh, here I've just represented this as just like a series of random gates. And we can ask the question, if these interactions were to mediate some information, so they were to mediate some uh, exchange interaction between your system and the inaccessible environment, then you can imagine that information goes out into that environment and comes back in at a later time in such a way that correlates uh, here in purple, time zero with time four, and then here in green, time zero with time three. And we can ask exactly what that means for us. We could say, measure the system at this time and measure it at this time and see whether the outcomes of those measurements were, were correlated in some way. And so a set of questions that we're interested in kind of studying is what types of interactions with an inaccessible environment um, can do this, so it can generate these temporal correlations, how can they be structured, and in particular sort of how can we access them, how can we measure them, and how can we manipulate them. And I haven't really motivated too much uh, why you might expect this to be the case. But essentially, whatever system that you have, whatever you've designed in the lab, it might be just like a single nuclear spin, it always has an inaccessible environment which is surrounding it. So something which is beyond your control, where the, um, the basic physics of the material, the, the consequences of fabrication, mean that there's some Hamiltonian which generates an interaction between that system and sort of all the the defects and, and um, the other business which is going on in the environment. And so generically speaking, you don't have purely control of your system. It is always interacting with an environment that you don't have control of. And what that means is that since the environment can behave in unpredictable ways, that essentially leads your system evolution to being stochastic. It's not sort of um, nice and determinable. And this is important because this is basically the mechanism from which you get noise in quantum computers. So the, the way that a quantum computer might behave erratically or whether it, like the way it, um, the, the current challenges that there are in getting quantum computers to work, this is um, uh, one of the foundational questions. But it also pertains to um, uh, a, a disparate set of problems like in condensed matter physics, like in quantum biology and um, all sorts of related fields where you want to say what, what is kind of the rough behavior of uh, some system that I'm interested in as it participates in some messy interaction with its environment. So to understand this, um, I want to first briefly talk about classical stochastic processes. So this is kind of the, the mechanism under which we have um, quantum stochastic effects. And a classical stochastic process is, broadly speaking, some non-deterministic dynamics. And everything that you can expect to understand about this non-deterministic dynamics is described by a joint probability distribution. So we're interested in some prob probability, sorry, we're interested in some property x. x can take different values at different times. And we have some joint probability distribution which allocates a probability to x taking uh, outcome xk at time tk, as well as xk minus 1 and time tk minus 1, all the way up to x0 at time t0. And this describes everything that, in principle, can be learned about the uh, underlying process. But uh, unfortunately, this is an exponentially large object. So um, we have like a series of Boolean ends, and um, uh, so the, the, the total number of possibilities here, we have to assign a, a probability to all the exponentially many um, possibilities. And so often uh, in nature and physics, you look for this simplifying Markov condition, which states that the, the probability distribution governing the system at some time tk doesn't depend on the series of outcomes at previous times. It only depends on the state of the system uh, one time back. And so then you can do things like derive stochastic master equations um, and really just look at like time local information. 
And so it's worth kind of thinking about the cases in which uh, you know, we get a distinction between these two things, and, and in particular, when a stochastic process can be complex versus non-complex and what that sort of means. So you can imagine that like a very easy stochastic process is rolling dice again and again, and you have a series of outcomes. Um, each outcome has probability one on six. There's no time dependence. There's no time correlation or anything like that. And that's very much Markovian. But um, on the, um, at the other end of the spectrum, you have something complicated like the, the stock market, and you might, might be interested in allocating probabilities to uh, a certain share taking different prices on different days. And um, this can effectively undergo some stochastic trajectory. And the difference between these two is due to a large number of factors, but um, you could kind of condense it down to uh, the number of discrete outcomes uh, that your system can take, um, the, and, and in particular, the number of variables which are responsible um, for this uh, share price kind of changing over time. So something could happen two weeks in the past, which you don't know about or which has no, no bearing on the next two weeks, but then uh, suddenly at some point in the future that changes um, the price of this. And so broadly speaking, we can uh, imagine that what really makes stochastic processes complicated are the sort of the hidden variables or the, the size and the complexity of the hidden variables of, of some environment. <clears throat> in the quantum case, this is much more difficult to deal with because in, so classically you can easily measure a system and not be so fussed about um, whether measuring it uh, changed anything about it. Like if I toss a coin and I look at the outcome of that coin toss, I didn't do anything to the system in order to get that information. But quantum mechanically, the situation is very different. So you have uh, different axes along which you can measure a quantum system, and the act of measuring it collapses the wave function in such a way that the future evolution is different depending on whether you did or did not do that measurement. And so a stochastic process has much more this kind of character where we can imagine that um, at a series of times, you know, we have our system as it's, as it's evolving and you can do things to the system. So you can say apply uh, transformations, but also you can apply measurements. And as you apply measurements, you get different outcomes and the future evolution of that system will depend on whatever outcome you had at that particular point in time. Um, and so a framework to deal with this um, is necessarily going to have to incorporate a series of control operations. So a way of partitioning what uh, in information about how you affected the system and information uh, kind of uh, partitioned separately from how, you, uh, how the environment affected the system. And so this was uh, developed um, here in, I guess, these very rooms at Monash in 2018 uh, by Felix Pollock and Kevin Modi and uh, other series of authors through an object called a process tensor. And the, the kind of the details of this, I suppose, aren't um, too significant to kind of get into at the moment. But the, the, bo the broad premise is that a process tensor is a multi-time generalization of a classical stochastic process to the quantum setting. So we have some system that interacts with an environment across a series of times, and we allow ourselves the possibility of probing that system with a series of control operations. And we basically want to know um, what multi-time effects are due to the control operations versus what has been generated um, due to these environmental interactions. And what this allows us to do um, is it allows us to resolve um, previous foundational issues with speaking about non-Markovian processes in the context of, of quantum mechanics. So just to unpack this idea a little bit further, um, Um, just to unpack this idea a little bit further, um, so again, we want to, we want to say that we, we, um, we're envisaging a system as it interacts with some environment, and we're applying a series of control operations. And you can imagine that every time you apply a control operation, we're taking like a state, it's being mapped by our laser pulse or our measurement choice or something like that, and then it's being fed back into the process. Now, if I look at a single one of these time steps, 
then what I might see is that I uh, send a state in, it participates in some dynamics, and then the state that comes out depends both on what state that came in, uh, as well as whatever the interaction was with the environment. But if I zoom out to look at a few different times at once, what I might see is that my choice of instrument at uh, this time A0, so whether I measure in the Z basis or the X basis or something, um, that choice of instrument can uh, basically feed into the environment, change something about the environment, and propagate forward to the next time. And then the next time uh, I feed in a, a state, what I get out depends not only on the state that came, came in, it also depends on my choice of operation at A0. And so the important point here is that you want to be able to propagate the state along, you want to have some description of the state's dynamics, and you want to also uh, account for the control operations that you chose. So these control operations allow you to manipulate the state, but they also, ah, oh, yes? Sorry, um, are these control operations or measurement operations, or potentially? <laughs> Both. Okay. So they're not projective measurement operations because that complete, because that begin was stalk at that point. That's right. They, they can't be completely projective operations, I mean, measurement operation, or if that would be it. Uh, we would have completed the objective state. Uh, well, so there can be projective measurements. So um, in particular, we want to allow for anything that you could do to a state. Uh, and so current uh, quantum technologies have the ability to projectively measure a state and uh, then just allow it to kind of continue participating in the dynamics. So it doesn't have to mean like you projectively measure and then nothing else happens again. Um, you, you feed forward a conditional state depending on the outcome of the projection. And what, what, what's kind of important about this, and actually you, you, you do require projective measurements, is that suppose, um, suppose I had an environment which was sort of you know, distributing information at different times, and um, I made a projective measurement, I get the outcome zero, and then I wait some amount of time, I, get, I do another projective measurement, and I get the outcome zero again. Uh, I wouldn't be able to, to discern whether I got the same outcome because I collapsed the state and then it just stayed zero, or if there was some correlation generated by the environment. But if I make a projective measurement, I get the outcome zero. I prepare a brand new state, let's say in state one, and then I measure again and I get the outcome zero. And then I do that lots of times and I get some statistically significant indication that these are the same measurement outcomes then that would be a clear indication that something about the environment caused these uh, measurement outcomes to be the same. Um, but you need to be able to do this for all sorts of uh, different bases and um, essentially span the space of operations of things you can do. So the, uh, I'm sorry about the question, but I know I to, they could be purely control operations with no measurement. Yes. Um, but you're allowing for also to potentially extract some amount of information. Exactly, because different control operations could or could not witness these. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Um, okay, and, and, and I guess to, to build off of that, the main point is that different control operations um, get uh, different back action from the environment, and so different control operations allow you to learn different things about the environment. So. You know, roughly speaking, controls are events that we choose. Uh, the process exists independently. Um, and so if I were to make different measurements at different times, then I would get a joint probability distribution with, say, my detector clicks with outcome xj at time tj. Uh, and I get this joint probability distribution. But that joint probability distri distribution would also be conditional on the controls that I chose. So this is sort of the fundamental way in which um, a quantum stochastic process differs from a classical stochastic process is that it also has to be cognizant of the control operations. We can't just um, have this pure, uh, this um, single joint probability distribution in time. Now, I don't want to get, I guess, uh, too bogged down in how this works, but I just want to point out um, for the next few slides that you can make a correspondence, a formal correspondence, between this quantum stochastic process and a quantum state, so a quantum many-body state. And the basic intuition is that you can associate uh, 
uh, some, uh, let's say, a qubit or two qubits per time. And all of the information contained within this state, according to this um, isomorphism, will be element by element identical to the process. And what's nice about this is it allows you to take temporal correlations, which are not very well understood, and to map them onto spatial correlations, which, as we've seen, are extremely well studied. So this correspondence allows us to now say that um, some multi-time process actually has a spatial analog. And so we can start asking the question, in what cases uh, do properties of this spatial state, um, such as entanglement, such as correlations, um, in what cases do different uh, environments essentially generate these structures? And, and how can they be interesting? How can we explore rich physics in this sort of temporal domain? So this motivated us to sort of ask the question, can we match our insights on tensor networks, or in particular tree tensor networks, with those of temporal correlations? So in the spatial case, we had long range spatial correlations, um, which as you remember, are distributed by this uh, tree-like structure. And we can imagine that like a similar, similar physical scenario could be an external environment which has different frequency scales. So maybe we have like some frequency, which is you know, some very high frequency, so some rapid interaction where information is being quickly exchanged. Uh, and so we would expect that to kind of distribute short range correlations. But then similarly, we might have like a different set of frequencies which get slower and slower, uh, which distribute longer range uh, frequencies and allow for basically not exponentially decaying temporal correlations, but rather polynomially decaying temporal correlations. And this is interesting, I think, from uh, a variety of standpoints. So in principle, this would allow for more efficient characterization of open quantum systems, uh, which have this particular structure. Um, it would also allow us to basically better understand, does there exist some notion on which we can separate out multi-time quantum processes according to universal properties that might conceivably be associated with a quantum phase? So to basically extend the notion or the physics of phases in the spatial case uh, to phases in, in a, in a multi-time process. And so uh, the way in which we do this is, is sort of in spirit with, with what we've seen so far, which is to take a hierarchical tree-like structure, except now each of these, um, uh, sorry, now each of the scales in this network uh, correspond to different temporal scales. So essentially like, you know, things on the nanosecond, the microsecond, the um, whatever's higher than microsecond. Um, and the very bottom of this tree-like structure is exactly this process tensor from before. So this corresponds to, oh no, I'll skip all, this is why you shouldn't have too many animations. Um, so these corresponds to uh, different times, and in particular, they correspond to locations in which you can make observations of the system. So in contrast to uh, a tree tensor network, uh, like what we saw before, these um, internal building blocks. So in a similar way, we have an internal building block. But in contrast, the internal building block has to have some internal structure. And that internal structure basically guarantees that what we're representing here is not just any old quantum state, that it is actually um, a multi-time process. So it needs to obey, say, for example, causal conditions. So um, you know, a, a, a causal condition might be that a measurement at some point in the future should not affect the statistics of some measurement outcome in the past, say. Um, yeah, and so this tree tensor network, um, this process tree tensor network encodes everything that we've seen so far about process tensors, except it gives it a structure which makes it efficient to look at uh, these long range correlations, and in particular is designed to kind of uh, coarse grain information into different time scales. So we can look at uh, the kind of typical properties of this tree tensor network, which is to say we can um, consider what we had before, which was to make measurements. Uh, so before we would like to look at the joint outcome of measurements on different sites in a quantum state, um, and then vary the distance between those sites.
Now we want to say, um, how does the measurement outcome of different operators as we vary the time between those operators change for this typical kind of tree? And what we see is that sort of by design, um, this tree exhibits polynomially decaying correlations. So we get this, um, this key linear decay on a log log plot, uh, which indicates that it is a polynomially decaying set of correlations. Um, and so this really um, vindicates the notion of this tensor network as um, it's a multi-time process. And in particular, this multi-time process has non-Markovian correlations, which decay uh, slowly with time rather than very quickly with time. So it allows us to understand uh, or to look at systems like this. And you can interpret this as kind of like a, a quantum 1 over f noise. So if you're familiar with 1 over f noise, which potentially people from astrophysics and these sorts of fields very much are, um, where you have um, a power spectrum that decays like um, f to the negative 1. Here we have um, a correlation function which decays like delta t to the negative something. But we don't just want to look at um, how this works in, as an ansatz. So, OK, we, we've, we've satisfied the conditions of um, we have a, a sort of process, and we can um, give that process different parameters, and we can look at how those parameters um, give us generic kind of non-Markovian processes with temporal de uh, polynomially decaying temporal correlations. But we also want to look at this in a practical setting. And for this, we examined uh, the spin boson model. So the spin boson model is a, a kind of paradigmatic model in condensed matter physics, which is essentially a single spin coupled to a bosonic environment. And that environment um, has some uh, spectral function. It behaves um, omic. These are not like important words uh, for the, the understanding. But basically, uh, this is like a, a nice toy model which people often work with in order to, um, to probe properties of open quantum systems. And what's known about the spin boson model is that it undergoes a quantum phase transition in a spatial sense. So you have a single spin coupled to an environment. And we can look at the properties of how that single spin's entanglement with the environment uh, depends on uh, the coupling of the dynamics. Um, and as it turns out, this um, undergoes some non-analytic transition where the entanglement basically dies off immediately at um, a characteristic value of the coupling. So what we did was to look at this spin boson model um, as a multi-time setting. So if we um, consider this as a multi-time process with uh, repeated interactions with this bath, then how do the memory properties of that behave as a function of the coupling of the system? And so uh, to start off with, we, we, we basically looked at how um, the correlation function um, moved as a function of time. Uh, so here we, we get this characteristic polynomial decay. Sorry, I perhaps wasn't clear, but this value alpha is the coupling between the spin and the bath. And as we vary that, we get um, different correlation function values as a function of changing uh, the value delta t. But in particular, um, for around this small range of alpha, you can see that there is polynomially decaying correlations. And so this serves as like a nice test bed for uh, the expected type of physics that we would think that this, this process tree should match well to. And so kind of heuristically, we looked at asking the question, well, how well if we take this model and we, we numerically construct it, how well can we fit our best tree to it? So um, we have a tree. We can parameterize it in terms of a whole bunch of parameters. And then we can perform some optimization, which basically fits the tree as well as possible. And then uh, says, well, OK, how well does that actually describe the physics of this um, complete model? And we, we looked at that as a function of this coupling value alpha. And what? Um, there's a lot going on in this plot. But essentially, what we see is this orange line uh, for some small number of parameters uh, tells us how well the fit works in contrast to this spin boson model. And it's in contrast to this red line 
which is essentially like the present way of, of representing this, these types of dynamics in an efficient way, in a tensor network way. Uh, and so what we, what we can see is that um, by employing a different geometry to represent the process, so looking at a hierarchical structure as opposed to this kind of linear structure, um, we're able to both more accurately and more efficiently represent this, this kind of paradigmatic model. So this is um, a nice vindication of the process tree, not just for, say, generic uh, structures, but rather to look at, you know, here's a real physical system that people are interested in for various reasons. And here we can show that um, this particular ansatz um, of dynamics is able to, um, to suit this, this class uh, essentially better than, than, than is presently understood. Now, the last thing I want to address, not in any particular detail, but just to say that, um, so that slide really looked at saying, if I give you some parameterized process, so I say here's like a very generic uh, model for my dynamics, and then I want to fit that model to what's really going on, how, what's the best that I could do. This isn't really a scalable way of doing things. And so what we can do instead is we can ask the question, uh, how do we do this all from first principles? So I give you a Hamiltonian, or you give me a Hamiltonian, um, which describes the evolution of some system with its environment. And you say, how can you go from this Hamiltonian to an efficient tree-like representation of, of this, um, this multi-time process? And the basic premise is to um, represent all of these um, represent the time evolution of this process in terms of like a essentially a space-time tensor network. So um, here we have uh, sort of like a spatial dimension which represents um, you know potential subsystems, and here we have a temporal direction which both has our system uh, as it evolves and potential environment evolution. And we can perform like the same kind of zooming out process, this renormalization process of this tensor network by replacing, um, performing what's called a plaquette move, where we replace um, more and more, so we, we group together, sorry, more and more sites in this and start associating them with something which is a little bit smaller. So the basic idea is we start with something, this grid of, say, like um, 8 by 8 or 8 by, yeah. Um, and then take four sites at a time and replace that with something which is physically sensible. And we keep performing this move um, until we end up with uh, something at the bottom. Something which remains, which is essentially uh, uh, performing the same kind of temporal coarse graining uh, that I described earlier. The, the details are perhaps um, maybe a little bit much for this, but um, essentially uh, we developed a method with, which allows us to sort of start from a, uh, a set of microscopic physics and um, a procedure to go from that microscopic physics to this efficient representation which encodes these kind of long-range correlations. And um, in principle, what this would allow you to do is to have um, a more numerically efficient way of studying and understanding non-Markovian open quantum systems in a, in a practical sense. So um, I guess in, in rough summary uh, of this sort of work, so um, tensor networks I think are, are very interesting. They're very interesting not only because they simplify matters uh, with respect to making calculations and, and um, doing kind of quantum information on a whiteboard, um, but the evolution of the field has very much been to take insights from this kind of graphical representation and um, to then ask the question, how does that graphical representation then represent correlation structures, which as it turns out, uh, correspond to different phases of, of quantum matter. And uh, the, the, the premise of this work was to really take this insight um, and combine it with our previous knowledge on non-Markovian systems, which um, which, which have this kind of spatial, uh, this representation as a quantum state, and to then really say, can we merge the two together to um, allow us to have insights on temporal correlations which decay slowly? So um, 
this on the practical or applied side of things is really intended to be like a more efficient way of both characterizing and simulating non-Markovian open quantum systems. But more speculatively, um, we would like to, to kind of push these ideas further and say, you know, how can we look for universal features of um, multi-time processes to kind of classify them into, into different sort of phases. Um, so with that, so thanks very much for listening um, and please let me know if you have any further questions. So when you talk about phase, traditionally or classically you talk about phase terms, you usually talk about N going to infinity and whatever that includes. Yeah. These are all fire systems. This, so I've, yeah, that's a, that's a very good point. This, I have depicted everything as like a finite system, um, but the study is, uh, is entirely equivalent in that we're taking n to infinity. We're taking like a thermodynamic limit. So typically when people ask about, um, say the scaling of some entanglement structure, they are really saying, if I have say an infinite dimensional spin chain and I look at an increasingly growing sub part of that spin chain, how does the entanglement grow uh, with respect? The other question I had is uh, when you talked about spatial correlations, you had that the power law uh, expression involving alpha. So this is a, this is essentially a, what we would call a critical exponent. Yeah. And you're looking for similar critical exponents in the temporal domain. Precisely. And you're also hoping that, that if you look at this generally, you're going to be able to get scaling relationships between various critical exponents, because you've got one there, but of course there are many different types of, well actually not many, there's a big finite number, they're all related through the renormalization group. Is this the sort of thing that you're trying to mimic? Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, I've kind of uh, brushed over this, but, um, you know, so we have short range entangled states and we have long range entangled states, and that's one way to kind of classify these phases. But the long range entangled states each have their own kind of internal classification. And so, so far what we've kind of looked at is just, is it um, exponential or is it polynomial? But ideally you would have some kind of uh, further classification which would look at, yeah, the, these sorts of like, how do the exponents change uh, within long range entangled processes? Uh, thanks for the uh, thought-provoking talk. Um, I'm intrigued by this idea of um, being able to uh, look at a bigger system spatially to substitute for propagating something for time. Um, maybe that's not the characterization of what I've seen. Um, if you dramatically simplify your your problem here, and this is potentially throwing the baby out of the bathroom. If you got rid of the environment, and if you even got rid of statistical uncertainty and working with pure stats, then um, understanding how the time independent tree reaction any sort of little system is, is or understanding um, uh, uh, a single bit of time evolution was strictly straightforward uh, for Alison Hamiltonian, which is just as exponentiating big matrix. <laughs> but time evolution for a system that's interacting with a series of controls and some becomes more complicated and you have to like propagate for the time control equation. And a formal solution for that is hard. I mean it's either the Dyson series or Mang's series or something like that. And in, in, and those become very nasty very quickly as you go through more time propagation. Is your tree process, if you boil it down to something so simple as as, as unitary evolution. Um, does your tree process have something to say about how to truncate the Dyson series or how to approximate the Magnus series or something, or any of those other things from, from basic time finite problem again? Or am I totally on the wrong thing? Um, I think you would have something to say, but I think it would uh, it'd be quite complicated to get there in the sense that so everything we're talking about here is kind of like uh, discrete chunks of time where from one time to the next, uh, there's just like an evolution that we take for granted, like a, already a solution to the Schrodinger equation. Um, rather than some continuous time evolution, which I guess the... So one example would be dynamical decoupling, which 
the process would say something about which would be a control technique. Yeah, I guess uh, it depends on your yeah yeah the the uh, the perspective from which you're 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 asking this, but. What this process tensor is is it, it's like a it's a linear mapping representing the dynamics as they have already been described, and then asks the question: How did those dynamics respond with respect to different choices of control operation? But the control operations are not like I wouldn't think of them as some uh, extra time dependent term in a Hamiltonian, but more like approximated as if in this instant of time you could transform the system in some way, how then does the, the future evolution kind of uh, change conditioned on that? So that controls its piecewise constant and Yes, yeah, yeah, more or less, yes. No, I think we know. But um, maybe we can talk more, more after. You could also send, uh, I think Greg's AI bot is touching a lot. <laughs> so, so is... That's an L. Um, <laughs> Greg, right at the end, you were talking about uh, in the space shows before, I was thinking, you were talking about like you have this group of like four things that you sort of group together into one via some some sort of like I guess can you speak more about like, how you do that grouping together? Is that like sort of a, a formal mathematical procedure? Or is that kind of like you just have to know the physics and make a punt? How's that work? Yeah, so it's a good question, and I think um, so. Okay, but the the. The basic premise is that we have this 2D network, and the 2D network is actually it's, it's hard to deal with. It's, it's unwieldy for, for various reasons. Um, and so what some people do, or what a, a common approach to this, is to replace these, these groupings of four with uh, a structure um, that somehow makes it mathematically easier. And once you have that structure, um, then, for example, you know, the, these, these pink triangles, these represent isometries. Isometries um, multiply out to give you unitaries, uh, and then you can kind of absorb them, and then you get this kind of zoomed out, zoomed out view. And I think your question is, how do you actually make this first move? So that is a question that that that's sort of like an unresolved question in terms of some rigorous analytic way to do it. That the the way that people predominantly deal with this is they have some local optimization of each of these constituent like plaquettes. And then you essentially find what's the best, best approximation of this type of structure with this type of structure locally. And so long as the error is sort of not too small in each individual location, then, um, then you can make the replacement and have a good approximation to your state. If, um, if the approximation is too bad, then uh, you can increase uh, basically the number of parameters in each of these things, which makes it less efficient, but makes it more accurate. 